Good morning. If you would go ahead and open your Bibles to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. We are currently studying Jesus. We're looking at who He is through the statements that others make about Him and through the statements that He makes about Himself. Our desire is to get to know this man named Jesus and to see if who He is in any way affects how we ought to live our lives. Now over the last several weeks we have looked at several claims made by Jesus and one and five of those claims come out of the book of Exodus and Moses before the burning bush and God claiming I am the existing one and Jesus has claimed to be the existing one before Abraham was one of his clearest claims to be deity Jesus has claimed to be the light of the world and he has invited us to let him guide us let him lead us let him show us what we ought to be doing he has made the claim that he is the gate that he is able to keep us safe and protect us if we will come to him he's told us that he is the good shepherd able to lead us well taking us to green pastures so that we have what we need to survive and last week we saw him make one of his boldest claims yet to be the resurrection and the life and in claiming that he showed that he was able to defeat death and that we no longer have to fear that we are able to entrust ourselves to him that he is faithful and true so this morning as we have spent several weeks sitting at the feet of Jesus looking at Jesus seeking to know him through his word I thought it would be beneficial for us to take a step back and see what Jesus's disciples said about him what, what did they claim about him and this will kinda of set up next week's lesson as well John the Baptist upon seeing Jesus for the third time cries behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and two of his disciples begin to then follow and Jesus turning and seeing these guys follow him they say what are you seeking what are you seeking and the disciples that are following reply rabbi which means teacher where are you staying and to their amazement I'm sure Jesus replies come and see so they came and they saw where he was staying and he stayed with them that day for it was the tenth hour this term rabbi refers to a teacher but it's a term of respect it's a term of acknowledging one knowledge I want to come to you I want to learn from you that's what John and Andrew are saying here I want to learn from you I want to gain knowledge from you that's this term rabbi and upon receiving this kind of information in verse 40 the two of them who heard John speak followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother and he went and found his own brother Simon and said to him we have found the Messiah which is translated means Christ so Andrew his response to this time spent with Jesus is that he has found the Messiah that's Hebrew translated into Greek as Christ or Christo this is a term of salvation but it doesn't always mean that it first derives its meaning out of the term anointed one see when somebody was set aside for a specific purpose they were first given the responsibility by being set aside for this specific work by anointing them with oil and that would set them apart for the work so Aaron was anointed with oil and set apart for his priestly ministry David was anointed king of Israel 
So this term anointed means one who's appointed by God, one who is set apart for a specific purpose. But it also has this idea attached to it of one who is appointed by God to save. The one from the line of David who would come and set, a, set apart and save the nation of Israel. So that's what is in this concept of the Christ, the Messiah. In just a short amount of time, they began to call Him this. The next day, Jesus is walking along and He comes in contact with a guy by the name of Philip. And Philip is so moved by his conversation with Jesus that he goes and tells his friend Nathaniel. And we pick up our reading in verse 45. And Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathaniel replied, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. So Nathaniel, maybe a little bit hesitantly, follows Philip. And upon meeting Jesus, he's blown away by this guy. And his response is found in verse 49. Nathaniel answered him. He said, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. There's a lot in that short little verse. Upon meeting Jesus. This is Nathaniel's response. Rabbi, you who know much, you honored teacher of Israel, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. To call someone the King of Israel was to refer to them as one who was anointed by God to be king. So we're beginning to see the the tapestry that John is weaving here in John 1 of the names that the apostles first called Jesus. The king is one who is anointed by God, set apart by God to be king. This is no more clear in David's case. Samuel goes to anoint David as king. And from that moment, the Spirit of God rests upon David as king, though for years he would not become king of Israel. And that spirit left Saul. God appointed David to be king. He set him apart for the specific purpose of that. But it's also saying that he is of the lineage of David. Nathaniel is claiming Jesus to be the Messiah, the chosen one of Israel, the descendant of David, who has the right... To be the Savior who will rule over Israel. That is what Nathan is claiming. There's one other aspect that comes into context here with this claim that he is king of Israel. To call someone king of Israel is also to put them in proper standing between themselves and the nation. Nathaniel is saying that Jesus is in right standing in regard to the nation. Jesus has the best intent. He's patriotic. He has the desire to see the nation grow in a direction that will benefit the nation. And then he calls him the Son of God, referring to his deity, referring to the fact that he is the Son of God, but also referring to the fact that Jesus is in proper standing with God. So in Nathan's claim that Jesus is the Son of God, the King of Israel, he is saying that he is in proper standing between God and man. He's saying that he is, in fact, the hope of Israel. But where did Nathan get this idea? I can't necessarily say for sure, but turn over in your Bibles, if you will, to Psalm chapter 2. In Psalm chapter 2... The psalmist writes this, starting in verse 6. But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain, and I will surely tell of the decrees of the Lord. He has said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask me, and I will surely give you the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. 
I don't know that this is what Nathan was referring to, but this is one place in Scripture where the concept of the Son of God and the King of Israel overlap. And this is very much a messianic part of the psalm. So Nathaniel is calling Jesus the hope of Israel. And Jesus confirms these claims that He is the Messiah, the Anointed One, the One who is set by God to rule the nation, to be its King, by claiming to be the Son of Man. A couple weeks back, we looked at that phrase, the Son of Man, referring both to Jesus' humanity as well as to His deity as the Messiah. And this is one of Jesus' favorite phrases about Himself. And Jesus also make re- makes reference back to being uh, Jose- Jacob's ladder, the pathway from earth to heaven. Maybe reference back to Jesus being the gate of the Good Shepherd. So Jesus confirms and affirms this. But there's one other thing that the disciples have missed. They've talked about it. But they've missed the implications of it. Back over in John chapter 1, starting in verse 45, Philip, just overwhelmed with excitement, runs to Nathanael and says, Get who we found. And he's like, I don't know. I'll give you a hint. Moses wrote about him and so did the prophets. Okay, you're taking too long. It's Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel's response is, Nazareth, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Could the Messiah, is anything written in the prophets about the Messiah coming from Nazareth? Well, what is Nazareth? Nazareth is a small town in the north of Israel. And Nazareth means a green shoot. Basically, Nazareth means green shootsville. Kind of like Garden City, I guess. That's where I'm from, Garden City, Kansas. It's not very green. It's in Kansas, the <laughs> plains of Kansas, right? But, but that's the name, right? So greens, Green Shootsville, that's basically what Nazareth means. There's a progression found in the prophets, and we won't get into all of, them, all of those uh, this morning. But in Isaiah chapter 6, God calls Isaiah... And Isaiah steps forward and he says, here I am, send me. And God says, Isaiah, go and tell this people, but understand they will not listen to you. And Isaiah goes, well, for how long? And God replies, until I have laid Israel waste. And the terminology that he uses is that of a tree that has been cut down. And he says, as the terebinth and the oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so Israel will be a stump in the land. But there's hope. A shoot will spring forth out of this dead stump, and the nation will grow back. The remnant. If we turn over a few more pages to Isaiah chapter 11, starting in verse 1, it says this, Then a shoot will spring forth from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots, and will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, and the Spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of strength, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will delight in the fear of the Lord, and he will not judge by what his eye sees, nor make decisions by what his ear hears. Isaiah is prophesying that out of the stump of Jesse, out out of the stump of David, would come a king that would rule as God intended. God's saying that I'm going to cut back the kingdom of David so far that you're going to go back to his father, Jesse. And out of Jesse, I'm going to pull a Messiah We see the climax of the series of prophecies in uh, Zechariah chapter 6, starting in verse 12. He says, Then say to him, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, a man whose name is Branch, 
For he will branch out from where he is, and he will build the temple of the Lord. Yes, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord, and he will bear the, throne, the honor and sit and rule on his throne. Thus he will be priest on his throne, and counsel of peace will be between the two offices. There will be somebody who comes forth called Branch. And he's going to sit on a throne as king. And he's going to reign as priest. And he will bring peace to all men. Matthew catches this. Matthew understands all of this. And in Matthew chapter 2, recounting the fact that, that Mary and Joseph are coming back from Egypt from fleeing. And Joseph is scared to go back to Bethlehem. So directed by God, he goes to Nazareth. And in verse 22, he says, verse 23, and, it, and he came to live in a city called Nazareth, and so was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets, that he shall be called a Nazarene. He'll be called a green shootsville, Leon. Right? I know I'm making up words here. But that's what Matthew is getting at. All the prophets have carried this concept through, and Jesus fulfills that in the fact that he is from Green Shootsville. He is the shoot out of the stump who will reign as king. So this morning we have seen several names, several attributes of Jesus. He's the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Teacher of Israel, the King of Israel, the Son of God, the Son of Man. He is the shoot of David. See, the, the line of David hasn't existed since the, Cab the Babylonian captivity. And since that time, David has not had a man on the throne. And Jesus steps out of history and takes that place. But these names, outside of de defining Jesus as the Messiah, as the Christ, doesn't necessarily tell us how we ought to live our lives. These are some interesting facts. These help us to gra grapple with the fact that He is indeed the coming Messiah, and that does impact our life. It impacts our salvation. But it doesn't tell us how to live. And I think that there's something out of this passage that we can grasp, that we can take home, and we can apply it this afternoon and the rest of this week, and hopefully the rest of our lives. And I think it's interesting how the morning class and my application this evening overlap. And I think God sometimes has a purposeful sense of humor in those respects. In John chapter 1... Starting in verse 40, Andrew, upon getting the opportunity to sit at the feet of Jesus, his reaction is to go and get his brother. In verse 41, he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah. Andrew's first reaction is to go and tell others what he has now seen. Philip gets the opportunity to talk with Jesus. And upon that conversation, he then goes and tells Nathaniel and says, Guess who we found? The one Moses wrote about. The one the prophets wrote about. Jesus of Nazareth. Come and see him. Because Nathaniel's very skeptical. What do you mean, Jesus of Nazareth? Philip doesn't have all the answers. He hasn't spent a lot of time with Jesus. But he goes... And he tells his friend, guess what I found? Guess who I've seen? And when he doesn't have the answer, he replies with, just come and see. Come and see. So how do we take this and apply it to our lives? Our reaction to Jesus should be the same. When we have the opportunity to sit at the feet of Jesus 
and hear him make claim after claim after claim about who he is. As he claims to be much more than a mere man. We should go and tell our friends. I've got to see Jesus. You should come and see him. And notice that the apostles do not simply say, I have found. They go and say, we have found. It's not simply upon my own testimony. It's not simply because I think so. It's because we as a group have studied and we have seen that this is true. And we take people and we say, I don't have all the answers. But I know what does. Let's study it together. Let's explore it together. And whether you've been coming to this church for years and decades or whether you have been coming for just today, you have the opportunity to go and tell your friends and your family, come and see what I have found. Come and experience Jesus of Nazareth, a man from a podunk town that some think nothing good can come out of. But come and see. Come and experience Him. Come and see Him. We all should have that kind of reaction. And if the church is going to be what it's supposed to be, if it's going to function the way that it's supposed to function, it means all of the members have to be out and about making an impact in their community, being that light to the world, and inviting others, come and see, come and experience Him, come and see what I found. I don't know where you're at this morning. Maybe you're ready to commit your life to Christ. Maybe you're not. Maybe you need to study this more. There's an opportunity to do that. We can set up a time to study. You can learn this book. You can discover for yourself, and we will simply open up the Bible and let the Bible speak, and you can decide, is it true or not? But regardless of where you are in your, your walk, we have the opportunity to go and to tell others, come and see, come and experience, come and meet Him. I hope that you will. If there's anything we can help you with this morning, we invite you to come as we stand and as we sing.